Live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India News R, India's voice to the world. I'm Amrit Pal Singh. Coming up in the next one hour, the International Monetary Fund raises India's GDP growth for financial year 24 25 by 30 basis points to 6.8%, up from previous prediction of 6.5% in January this year. Israel's war cabinet meets again to decide on its response to the Iranian attack. Iran warns of severe and painful response if its interests are targeted. International markets trade in the red as conflict in West Asia spooks investors. Gold and oil prices dip. and hunt for potential jurors on uh, day two of Donald Trump's historic hush money trial begins in New York. And the torch for the Paris 2024 Olympic Games lit in ancient Olympia in a traditional ceremony ahead of the Games, which start on the 26th of July. Uh, tensions continue to escalate following Iran's drone and missile attacks on Israel last Saturday. Israel has firmly stated that it will not let Iran's actions go unanswered, convening its war cabinet again to determine its military response. In the midst of a standoff, uh, Iran remains resolute, promising retaliation against any threat to its interests. There seems to be no end to the ongoing Middle East tensions as Israel warned that Iran's attack would not go unanswered. Israel's war cabinet convened for the third time to deliberate on their course of action. This comes after Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu hastily summoned the war cabinet for the second time in less than 24 hours following Iran's missile and drone strike. I want to thank all our international partners who stood up to Iran's aggression. Iran's attack has created new opportunities for cooperation in the Middle East. We are closely assessing the situation. We remain at our highest level of readiness. Iran will face the consequences for its actions. We will choose our response accordingly. Meanwhile, Iran stands firm, vowing to retaliate against any aggression targeting its interests. Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi and Foreign Minister both issued stark warnings, emphasizing that even the smallest action against Iran will be met with a severe and widespread response. Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi told Vladimir Putin by telephone that Tehran strikes on Israel were limited and that the Islamic Republic was not interested in escalating, the Kremlin said on Tuesday. If the Israeli regime makes a mistake, this time Iran's response, as Iran's military commanders announced, will not be minimal, but immediate and severe. Internationally, efforts to defuse the situation are underway. Iraq has urged restraint during talks in Washington, while German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock will travel to Israel for discussions on how to prevent an escalation of tensions in the region. I will make another trip to Israel today to assure our Israeli partners Germany's full solidarity and we will talk about how a further escalation with more and more violence can be prevented. Amid the tension, security measures are heightened on the Italian island of Capri, where G7 foreign ministers are gathering from April 17 to 19. The ministers from major Western powers aim to present a unified front in calling for a de-escalation of hostilities between Israel and Iran. 
And for more on that story, uh, we are joined by DD India correspondent uh, Alex uh, Kadir, who's joining me from Tel Aviv. Uh, hi, Alex. Uh, the Israeli War Cabinet met again today. What are you gathering on? What sort of military response are they mulling uh, in, the, in response to the April 13 attacks by Iraq? Well, I think what's clear is that we're not going to get details of what that response will be until it has already happened. And in some ways, it may already be happening. We have reports that a top Hezbollah commander in southern Lebanon was killed in an Israeli drone strike just in the last few hours. Two separate strikes. So it appears the uh, Israeli military ramping up its efforts in uh, southern Lebanon against Hezbollah. And that would track with what we've been hearing from U.S. officials about the kind of response that Israel uh, is considering to that massive attack by Iran, one that would target Iran's proxies, but not Iran directly. So uh, more aggressive posture against Hezbollah, perhaps more aggressive posture against Hamas in Gaza, and perhaps even against the Houthi rebels in Yemen. That may be the way or one of the ways in which Israel will respond. There is also the possibility of things behind the scenes, like cyber attacks and certainly a big diplomatic push. The foreign minister of Israel writing to 32 separate countries in what he called a diplomatic offensive against Iran. What seems to be happening also is that that escalation that the world feared may not be happening just yet. Okay. And the German uh, foreign minister, uh, Alex, is also uh, in Tel Aviv in a bid to de-escalate tensions. The U.S. has already made it stand clear that it will not support any military retaliation by Israel. It uh, stands in its defense, but not in a military offensive. So what sort of an impact is the diplomatic pressure having on Tel Aviv when they take their decisions? I think there'll be two uh, impacts. One is uh, 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 more, uh, more countries being sympathetic to Israel. So perhaps an improvement of Israel's standing in the world, a standing that has taken quite a severe beating as a result of its military operations in Gaza, something that has divided the world and certainly put a lot of pressure on Israel diplomatically. So uh, Iran's actions, Iran's violence, Iran's recklessness, as the Israelis see it, will perhaps improve diplomatic relations for Israel with others. It will also further isolate Iran, a country that has uh, taken risks with the holy city of Jerusalem uh, in that those rockets were interception of, uh, intercepted above that city and could have caused very serious destruction to profoundly historical and religious sites in the holy city of Jerusalem. So two, two possible outcomes here diplomatically, uh, more support for Israel by some countries that were getting very frustrated with the level of violence exerted by the Israeli defense forces in Gaza and more isolation for Iran. We'll have to see. It will take a few weeks for us to be uh, very clear on exactly what those consequences may be. All right. Alex Kadir, many thanks for joining us from Tel Aviv to give us that update. And the second day of the jury selection of uh, in Donald Trump's historic hush money trial got underway on Tuesday. Uh, the, as law, lawyers try to choose a panel of 12 residents of heavily democratic Manhattan to hear the former U.S. president's criminal case impartially. The first day on Monday underscored the challenges of the task. Roughly half of 100 potential jurors questioned were dismissed after saying they could not impartially judge the polarizing businessman turned politician who's mounting a comeback uh, at the White House bid while battling four separate criminal cases. Donald Trump arrived at a court for the second day of the criminal trial and addressed reporters in hallway saying this trial is a disgrace and that, sh uh, should, not have, uh, that should not have been brought. This is a trial that should have never been brought. It's a trial that is being looked upon, looked at all over the world, they're calling. They're, they're looking at it and analyzing it. Every legal pundit, every legal scholar said this trial is a disgrace. We have a Trump-hating judge. We have a judge who shouldn't be on this case. He's totally conflicted. But this is a trial that should never happen. And DD India correspondent Will Denslow joins us from New York. Uh, for more, Will, Trump says it's a trial should, that should not have been brought. Uh, but the judge is confused. He attacks the judge. He says uh, it's a disgrace. Uh, what sort of, uh, he's calling it a political vendetta. Now, what sort of impact could this have? Could it uh, in the long run prove to be a shot in his arm?
Well, jury selection is expected to take a couple of weeks and it, it is likely going to be an incredibly fraught process. We're already seeing that playing out here in the court in the just over a day uh, that jury selection has been underway. I think a good example of seeing just how difficult it will be to whittle down a group of people to just 12 jurors here in Lower Manhattan is the fact that on Monday afternoon, 96 people were uh, brought in to be prospective jurors. They were asked the question, do you think you could be on this jury and could be impartial? More than half of those put their hands up and said that they couldn't, whether they are uh, active supporters or critics of the former president. That essentially ruled them out immediately from being able to serve on this jury. So that just shows how difficult it'll be uh, in this process going forward. It's also important to remember that Donald Trump himself tried to move this case outside of Manhattan, arguing that because uh, Manhattan is a part of New York City that leans heavily Democratic, he believed that that would mean it'd be very difficult for him to find uh, a fair group of jurors that could be impartial. This is a process that's slated to last a few weeks. Both prosecutors and the defence will have to essentially vet and OK uh, the 12 jurors. And the judge warns that the process is already behind schedule. So we're waiting in the coming days to see if we can whittle this, this group down a little closer uh, to the dozen people needed to sit on this jury panel. Uh, in your opinion, how long could this whole uh, selection of the jurors take well? According to analysts, it's a process that could take up to two weeks. So oh. an incredibly long time, considering this trial is slated to last just two months in of itself. And we're already seeing plenty of legal wranglings, plenty of back and forth distracting in many ways from the jury selection process. We've uh, seen uh, just during proceedings this Tuesday so far, uh, prosecutors have warned Donald Trump about the gag order that's in place on him, warning that further violations of this gag okay. order, which <clears throat> applies to him railing against the judge, against potential witnesses, could result in Donald Trump facing fines or even 30 days behind bars. Donald okay. Trump taking to uh, social media in the last day or so has again complained about uh, this gag order placed on him by Judge Juan Machan, saying that it is unconstitutional. It impinges uh, on his ability to uh, get his points across. He says that it impacts his campaigning. This is a huge issue considering the fact that while he's in the courthouse, he'll have to be here every day that right. the courthouse is in session. He would otherwise be spending that time on the campaign trail. So many think this could have huge political as well as personal ramifications for the former president. Some recent polling also provides some somewhat illuminating uh, examples of how this trial could potentially impact the U.S. electorate come November's election. According to a Reuters Ipsos poll, 64 percent of registered voters say that they deem that this criminal trial that Donald Trump faces would be at least somewhat serious in their minds. All right. Uh, many thanks, uh, William Aldenslow, for joining us from Washington, D.C. And still to come up on DD India News Hour, election campaign for the first phase of Lok Sabha elections in India picks up momentum. In Sikkim, the practice of 100% organic farming, a key issue in the election campaign this time around. DD India talks to Chief Electoral Officer of Meghalaya on the election preparations in the state. Voice of a rising aspirational world. Stories of challenges, struggles and accomplishments. A world battling conflict, hunger and poverty. Embracing growth, development, science and technology. A voice of progress, a voice of unity. Watch Voice of the Global South with me, Akshay Dongre, only on DD India. You're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Amrit Pal Singh. 
And uh, let's now get you the latest on the world's largest democratic election in India. And as the polling date nears, it will be soon upon us when the world's largest democracy begins a mammoth exercise of voting uh, to the 18th uh, Lok Sabha or the lower house of the Indian Parliament. In the first phase of April, on April 19th, 102 seats go to the polls. April 17th is the date that marks the last day of campaigning for the first phase. Remember, this election is in seven phases, after which a silent period begins to allow voters to prepare themselves mentally and otherwise to cast their vote. On the penultimate day of campaigning, stalwarts from all the major parties made frantic efforts to gain the voters' confidence. Uh, my colleague Mihir Mikuri brings us the day's election roundup. As each day, hour and minute unfolds, the momentum of campaigning for the first phase of India's general election steadily accelerates. The impending poll day scheduled for April 19th holds significance as it encompasses 102 crucial seats. On Tuesday, Prime Minister spearheaded the BJP's election charge, embarking on a marathon of rallies through eastern India. Prime Minister held two rallies in Bihar, one in Gaya and other in Purnia, before proceeding to hold two additional rallies in West Bengal, specifically in Balur Ghat and Rai Ganj. <laughs> और बंगाल को बहुत आगे ले जाना है इतने बरसों तक बंगाल में सरकार चलाने वालों ने बंगाल को कितना पीछे कर दिया है लेकिन मैं आपको बताना चाहता हूं Bengal ka vikas ye Modi ki pratpikta hai. Later in the evening, Prime Minister also held a roadshow in Guwahati in Assam, aiming to garner support from the voters. Tuesday saw BJP National President JP Nadda hold multiple roadshows in Tamil Nadu's Ramanathpuram, Tenkashi, and Perambalur, energizing the support for the party's candidate. Senior leader and Defence Minister Rajnath Singh held public meetings in Tamil Nadu's Krishnagiri and Tiruvan Malai. Meanwhile, senior BJP leader and Home Minister Amit Shah addressed public rallies in Jammu and Uttarakhand's Kotwar. Later in the day, the Home Minister led a roadshow in Madhya Pradesh, Chindwada. Senior BJP and Union Minister Anurag Singh Thakur further contributed to the campaign efforts by holding a public rally in Kishtwar, advocating for votes in support of the party's candidate, Dr. Jitendra Singh, who is contesting from the Udampur seat. On Tuesday, Union Minister and BJP candidate from Guna, Jyoti Raditya Sindhya, submitted his nomination for the elections. The Bharatiya Janata Party revealed its 12th list of candidates for the upcoming Lok Sabha elections. The list comprises seven candidates with a diverse representation from various states including Punjab, Uttar Pradesh, Maharashtra and West Bengal. In the opposition camp, senior Congress leader and candidate from Wayanad, Rahul Gandhi, conducted multiple roadshows in Kod and Malapuram aiming to garner support for the party. The Congress Party and the India Alliance is trying to save the constitution of India. Tuesday also witnessed Priyanka Gandhi Wadra conducting roadshows in Assam's Jorhat before journeying to Tripura where she held another roadshow in Tripura West. Congress released another list of three candidates in Jharkhand for the upcoming Lok Sabha elections. Samajwadi party leader Dimple Yadav filed a nomination papers from Manpuri Lok Sabha seat on Tuesday. BSP also released a fresh list of 11 candidates for the upcoming Lok Sabha election and the Aam Admi party released a list of four candidates from Punjab. Tuesday also saw DMK releasing its manifesto titled Kowai Rising for the upcoming elections. As the nation gears up for the elections, all eyes are on the unfolding political developments in the world's largest democracy. Mihir Makuri's report for DD India.
And one of India's uh, northeastern states, Sikkim, is going to the polls on the 19th of April for its lone parliamentary seat and it's also for its 32 assembly seats that are the seats of the state. Uh, fierce campaigning is on by all political parties, uh, fighting it out over a range of promises and issues. One of the issues uh, this time around is the practice of 100% organic farming. Sikkim is the only state in India which uh, was declared fully organic in 2016 by Prime Minister Narendra Modi. But sustaining the practice now seems to have its own set of challenges. DD India's Gotham Roy reports from capital Gangtok. Organic and inorganic produce being bought and sold in Gangtok's Lal Bazar, a shopping hub in Sikkim's capital. Sikkim went into 100% organic farming after 12 years of efforts. Prime Minister Narendra Modi declared the state fully organic during a visit to it in 2016. But since then, keeping it going seems to have become a challenging affair. We are in Gangtok's iconic landmark Lal Bazar where organic produce from within Sikkim and inorganic produce from outside are both sold. And the shopkeepers who deal here with organic produce have a list of complaints that range from price competitiveness with the inorganic produce from outside as well as transport. There are problems with transport. The roads are bad, vehicles have to take longer routes. Transport charge doubles. We have increased rates somewhat. People say it's become too expensive. Sales are a bit low these days. A lot of cheaper, inorganic vegetables come from outside. Smart Mart has also opened a lot. Even online shopping has affected us. Going fully organic was the initiative of the previous Sikkim Democratic Front government in the state, which is now in opposition. The SDF alleges that the ruling Sikkim Krantikari Mocha government is not promoting organic processes with as much sincerity. But representatives of the ruling SKM rubbish the opposition's charges. It's a wrong propaganda that the opposition is doing. Those who are doing farming, we are giving them incentives. You see a manifesto this year. We are promoting organic farming. Organic farming and organic produce is Sikkim's USP. It's what brings this land global recognition, even India is put on the map. Clearly, it needs to be nurtured further to ensure that it brings maximum benefit to all the stakeholders who are involved in it. With Canvas and Sumit Diman, this is Gautam Roy in Gangtok for DD India. And India's Nagaland will also go for polls on the 19th of April in a single phase. Youth expect better road connectivity and sanitation facilities. The state will witness a triangular showdown. DD India's Taposh Bhattacharya reports. In Nagaland, the countdown for the Lok Sabha election intensifies. With just days left until the pivotal election on April 19th, the air is thick with anticipation and fervor as candidates vie for the trust and support of Nagaland's electorate. The candidate in focus are National Democratic Alliance candidate Dr. Chumbun Muri and Congress candidate S. Supong Miren Jamir. As the campaign trail winds through the diverse landscape of Nagaland, the voices of its people echo with key issues that will decide the fate of the election. Cry for better roads and improved sanitation is a major point in these elections. Residents demand solution to enhance mobility. With a new selection of this uh, newly elected candidate, you know, I hope there will be some better changes. We are from a small state compared to the bigger picture. So we also want certain attentions towards our side so that we can also have proper developments and facilities, job opportunities. Calls for greater integration and economic opportunities are also the key issues here. The quest for preserving cultural heritage intertwines with the pursuit of livelihoods. The political landscape of Nagaland has witnessed fervent battles in the past. I am 100% certain that now that new name has been given to him, Mr. Superman Jameer will keep the Congress flag flying with the blessings of people of Nagaland and Congress will emerge victorious. Lok Sabha, a member from Nagaland, was from our alliance. And we will continue to work with the same vision which our under the leadership of our Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji has been providing to the state of Nagaland. Younger voters in several districts started tackling unemployment as among the most pertinent points 
when looking at election. With an impressive turnout of 84.5% in the 2019 Lok Sabha elections, Nagaland demonstrated its unwavering commitment to the democratic process. As the election day draws near, Nagaland stands at the crossroads, poised to shape its destiny and carve a path towards a brighter future. With camera person Naveen, this is Tapush Bhattacharya for GD India from Kohima, Nagaland. And let's now talk about another northeastern state of India, Meghalaya which has a youth population of about 74%. It's one of the youngest states in India. Amid the high-pitched political battle ahead of the general election, the youth of the state are raising the demands uh, to the candidates for the future of their state. Here's a report by my colleague Akshay Dongre on what the youth of Meghalaya are demanding in these elections. As polling date for the general election draws closer in the state of Meghalaya, the political parties are making an all-out effort through poll promises to woo the voters. Amidst the high-pitched political noise, many among the most important section of the society, the youth, feels unheard. We want the government to, uh, to increase the employment, first and all for us. I think that the candidates of the, who, are elect, who are contesting elections are talking about your issue? Uh, no. As per the latest estimates, Meghalaya has a population of approximately 38 million people, of which over 74%, over 28 million, are under the age of 35 years, much above the national average of 65%. For many among the youth, local issues are also a key concern in the national elections. We need better road conditions, uh, better traffic management, and maybe uh, the cost of living is quite a bit high, and something to help that would be nice. Meanwhile, for many, the lack of good employment opportunities and lack of infrastructure in the state is the biggest poll issue. In a small state like Shillong, we are not able to even construct an industry or a factory. So that is the key concern. The ones who graduated and post-graduates, they are still facing issues in like getting jobs and all. So I think they should give more opportunities to the students in getting jobs. The state of Meghalaya is one of the most attractive tourist destinations in India and has one of the biggest percentage of youth population in the country. However, despite the many strengths and opportunities, the state also faces several critical obstacles in its development efforts, like inadequate infrastructure, insufficient access to markets and an underdeveloped private sector, which, if overcome, can make the state one of the most developed in the country. With over 74% of youth population, Meghalaya is one of the youngest states of India. And as the elections cast a spotlight on the demands of the ambitious youth of the state, the need for the candidates is to prioritize the need of the younger generation, which can unleash an immense potential of Meghalaya. In Shillong, Meghalaya, with camera person Ashish Sharma, Akshay Dongre, DD India. And Akshay caught up with the Chief Electoral Officer of uh, Meghalaya, Dr. BDR Tewari, on the election preparations for the state. Listen in. We are right now in the city of Shillong, the capital of Meghalaya, and we have with us the Chief Electoral Officer of Meghalaya, uh, BDR Tewari. Sir, uh, first of all, thank you so much for talking to us. What are the preparations, especially preparations that you have done, uh, keeping in view this large scale of elections that are going to take place? Uh, our state is going for the parliamentary election in first phase, which is on the 19th of April. We are having around 3,512 polling stations and uh, we closely worked for a very free, fair, facilitative and smooth election uh, in all polling stations. Around 50 polling stations are there. They have to go by walk or a few they have to go by boat also. But all the stations uh, we are covering either in one day or few in two days. Mm. So it is P2 polling stations. We have made the uh, turnout implementation plan up to the booth level to enhance the voters' participation right. and enhance mm. the overall voting percentage in this Lok Sabha election. are on the campaign trail, uh, where t especially in the states which are going uh, to the first phase of, uh, of polls. The BJP is also, like other political parties, leaving no stone unturned in the constituency of Dibrugarh in Assam to win the political battle. 
The BJP organized a large public meeting in the Namrup area of the Brugger constituency to woo voters and the BJP candidate and union minister Sarbanand Sonowal was enthusiastically welcomed to the public rally by political workers with flowers shard on him with sounds of traditional drums and dholes. Sonowal spoke to DD India correspondent Debiandu Mondal on why he has an upper edge from Dibruga. Listen in. Uh, I'm joined by the Union Minister Sarbananda Sonowal, sir. What are the issues that you're contesting this election on? It looks people's happiness well reflected through their like, you know, response. So I believe they are happy whatever Modi ji has done for the country, for the state of Assam. In the last 10 years. So that's why everyone is like putting their tremendous faith on Modi's and they believe that if Modi's is there, growth is faster. And let's now take a look at other stories making news around the world. The European Union has decided to allocate $3.71 billion towards safeguarding the ocean and advancing sustainability through various initiatives this year. EU's top environment official announced a list of 40 commitments to protect the oceans on Tuesday. This includes combating marine pollution, backing sustainable fisheries and fostering investments in the blue economy. About 990 homes and residential plots in Russia's Kurgan region near the Tobol River and uh, Kazakhstan border are submerged in floodwaters due to rapidly rising water levels. In the Orenburg uh, region, approximately 30 kilometers of protective uh, dams have been constructed with thousands of personnel engaged in rescue operations. UAE is uh, gripping with severe weather crisis as heavy rains batter the region, resulting in widespread flooding and travel chaos. Meanwhile, neighboring Oman mourns the loss of several lives following devastating flash floods. Authorities have issued urgent advisories, urging residents to remain indoors unless absolutely necessary to step out. At least 18 people have lost their lives in Oman due to the floods, including one Indian national from Kerala. And still to come up on DD India News Hour, a discussion with an expert in our studio, uh, with an expert on the impact of the war between Israel and Iran on West Asia region. And UK government criminalizes deep fakes creation. India's election body acts against 169 complaints of poll code con uh, violations. Elections team poll pulse has reached India's northeast in Assam. This is the tea city of India, Dibrugar. They are not getting jobs in the local area, like in Dibrugar or nearby districts and all. Home to the finest tea, the state is set for a cracker of a contest. This is 2024. Can the Congress and allies offer a fight back or will the Modi juggernaut be unstoppable? Watch Pole Pulse on DD India. You're watching uh, DD India News Hour. I'm Amrit Pal Singh. As a direct fallout of the geopolitical tensions in West Asia, the impact of the markets was evident. Global stocks slid to a two month low on Tuesday, while the dollar, that's the US dollar, rose to its highest in over five months. Asian stocks sank further and closed in the red. Geopolitical tensions in the Middle East kept uh, the risk sentiment in check dipping prices of both gold and oil in international markets. Amid fears of a full-blown crisis between Israel and Iran moving down the escalation ladder and spilling over to wider West Asia, market uh, watchers say difficult days ahead are ahead for global stock markets and economies. 
And to talk more about that, I'm joined by Professor Sachin uh, Chaturvedi, eminent economist. He's the DG of RIS. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Chaturvedi, for joining us on the show. First of all, uh, you know, what do you, uh, ex all experts are saying if this continues to play out the way it is, and given the rhetoric coming out from both sides, that doesn't augur well, one, as we're seeing both for the markets, for investors because they're jittery, for oil prices, how could it affect the global economy, which is still trying to find its feet post-COVID? No, you're absolutely right, um, Mr. Pal. If you see uh, stocks and bonds, their values have fallen. The value of gold and oil both have gone up uh, over the weekend. Monday, they opened up on uh, on much higher end. Uh, the challenge now is uh, uh, how do we see a uh, response coming out from, uh, from Israel? Uh, as we see frustration among... Uh, Arab leaders, the uh, restraint and the counseling that is coming from West, they have cornered uh, new action that Israel was planning at some point, and we are still to see uh, as uh, subject experts are uh, calculating the losses, uh, the volatility index is five times higher in in, uh, in last 10 months. So, so we are seeing this uh, huge geopolitical uh, hostility uh, in a way, you know, bringing in axis of resistance where uh, how these Hamas and now Iran has jumped in. So that uh, has actually accentuated crisis. What we were seeing uh, with Red Sea already, uh, the oil prices going up. Now we are again ending up with similar situation. And Amir Pal, this has happened at a time when the world is preparing for the IMF World Bank meeting. Uh, hmm. uh, the agenda of uh, geopolitical tension, inflation, interest rates. We were grappling with these challenges and suddenly this has uh, now got escalated in the uh, region. We source about, I think, two-thirds of our oil requirements from West Asia. If this uh, escalates further, goes in the region, what does that mean for oil prices? What impact could it have, especially for India? That's right, uh, Anupal. Uh, our uh, sort of diversification after the Red Sea crisis, uh, it has helped in, in a way to cope up with the geopolitical challenges that we have. Hmm. But this would also affect China. It would also affect uh, uh, U.S. They all are sourcing uh, um, uh, oil from this region. So a large part of the world would again face this challenge of inflation. The spillover effects uh, would not be easy to stop. And, and, and this would create a real uh, challenge. And that's why everybody is uh, advising Israel to, uh, to hold on and, and see uh, where it is going. In fact, if you see uh, for the IMF uh, uh, World Bank spring meeting, which is to begin uh, the International Development Association, which has uh, a $200 billion landing arm, now has come up with one of the biggest budget proposal uh, to, uh, to assist LDCs, the least developed countries, and uh, uh, the low-income uh, uh, developing countries. This implies, in terms of the challenges the world economy is facing, from the Red Sea crisis, from the uh, challenges that were already there because of the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, Russia, and increasingly between uh, Hamas and, uh, and Israel. So the challenges are going to be huge. You asked uh, about India, and uh, as we all are afraid, uh, uh, the challenges would accentuate uh, uh, inflationary conditions, particularly uh, mm. led by the oil price rise that we may expect in the near future. Okay. It's uh, <clears throat> nobody's. Uh, I mean, there's no gainsay in saying that uh, global supply disruptions because of the Ukraine-Russia uh, uh, conflict uh, ca cause devastating consequences. This could also, if it uh, goes further, escalates further, would have its impact. I'm asking a specific question, Professor Chaturvedi, about the sea lanes important sea lanes pass through this region. We saw the incident of uh, MSC Aries happen, though it was in the state of Hormuz. We've had the issues of piracy, the Yemenis, the, the Houthi rebels. But if it escalates, how could these sea lanes impact, especially what impact do you see on the Asia-Pacific theater? There are three implications which have been analyzed empirically. Hmm. 
Hmm. And I would say uh, the idea of uh, rising cost of uh, uh, additional travel that the containers and ships have to make. Okay. Uh, the estimation suggests that the cost would be higher, uh, 20 to 28 percent. And if you see the uh, longer time span that it would take, the perishable products and their movements would become restricted. The third implication would be in terms of insurance and reinsurance jackup that we are expecting. So these three we have been saying right from November onwards in terms of how the challenge is going to imply. What Nepal now has happened is in terms of uh, not only blocking of Red Sea and, uh, and sea lanes that are there, but also primary sources of supply, which are also getting now affected. Iran and, and the oil that, that is coming out from, from Russia, they would get affected. And that would have severe implications. Okay. We would have to see both in terms of how uh, the routes which are uh, away from this do not lead to escalation in uh, insurance and, and reinsurance prices that are there. The limitation of container and their movements, they are also going to be affected okay. because the demand from China and from U.S., the two countries which have been lending their uh, ships and containers to, uh, to other countries, that would also get adversely affected. And that's uh, the biggest worry at this point. All right. We leave it there. Professor Sachin Chaturvedi, many thanks Thank for uh, joining us and giving us a perspective Thank on you. the developments in West Asia. Thank you. And major steps are being taken against the issue of deep fake in the United Kingdom. The UK government has announced to criminalize the creation of intimate deep fake images. The UK government has announced on Tuesday that it will criminalize the creation of sexually explicit deep fake images. As per the new guidelines, anyone found guilty of creating fake sexual images of people without their consent will face a criminal record. If the image is then shared more widely, offenders could be sent to jail. It will also strengthen existing offences. If a person both creates this kind of image and then shares it, the government could charge them with two offences, potentially leading to their sentence being increased. As part of the Criminal Justice Bill, which continues its passage through Parliament, the government is also creating a range of new criminal offences to punish those who take or record intimate images without consent. What is the fake? Superimposing another person's face and voice into a real video is called deepfake. Deepfakes confuse people since they look real. Audiovisual editing technology is now commonly available to manipulate videos and photos. The programs use machine learning and AI or artificial intelligence. The technology uses coder and decoder technology. Identical fake videos and photos can be created. India has also taken stringent actions against the offenders. As per the latest advisory, government has directed all platforms to comply with IT rules. Deep fakes is a big issue. It's a very big problem for all of us. We had recently issued notices to all the big social media platforms asking them to take steps for identifying deep fakes, for removing those uh, content the social media platforms have responded. They are taking their actions. Advisory suggest emphasizes that digital intermediaries must ensure users to be informed about penal provisions in case of violations. It also says that reasonable efforts should be in place to prevent users from hosting, displaying, uploading, modifying, publishing, transmitting misleading content. It also aims to ensure platforms identify and promptly remove misinformation, false or misleading content and material impersonating others including the fakes. Advisory also aims to ensure platforms identify and promptly remove misinformation. As technology improves, it may become more difficult to identify the fakes. Currently, such videos can be identified by facial expressions, eyebrows, lip movements and mannerisms that are not associated with the person being copied. Bureau Report, DD India. The United Kingdom will host its parliamentary elections this year, though the date is still not in public domain. All 650 seats are up for grabs. 
which means a new party could take uh, power and a new prime minister could take charge. DD India's Stuart uh, Smith has more from London on how this all could unfold. From northern Scotland to southern England, in cities and villages, the British people are preparing to vote. For 650 prospective lawmakers, there's one goal, to represent their part of the UK in the national parliament. It's here in the House of Commons where members of parliament, or MPs, debate the issues of the day. But for any lawmaker to get here, they need to be voted in. Each adult UK citizen or Commonwealth citizen who has permission to live in the UK can choose to vote. They give you a ballot paper which could be just three names on it, Tory, uh, Conservative, Labour and Liberal Democrat, or it could have about 20 names on it with loads of independent candidates and so on. But in the actual act of voting, all you've got to do is mock one candidate. People choose who they would like to represent their local area or constituency. The UK is broken up into 650 of them and one lawmaker represents each location. In that constituency, you can have someone who only gets, say, 25% of the vote. Um, but as long as they win more votes than the next person, then they will be declared duly elected. Usually a candidate will run as part of a political party, but they don't have to. In power since 2010 is the more right-leaning Conservative Party, headed by Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. Their strongest rival is the more left-wing Labour Party, headed by Keir Starmer. Other parties exist, but they aren't likely to take power, with the UK traditionally a two-party system. When the election is over, party leaders see how many of their candidates have won, and if one party has more than half the lawmakers in Parliament, they can form a government. If not, they can agree to work with one of the smaller parties to form a coalition. But right now, polls predict the opposition Labour Party is in for a strong chance of winning far more than half the seats in Parliament, meaning it's likely to be a Labour government, with Keir Starmer, the favourite, to be the next Prime Minister. Stuart Smith in London, reporting for DD India. The International Monetary Fund, or the IMF, in its latest outlook has raised India's growth projections uh, for 2024-25 from 6.5% to 6.8%. India maintains its position as the fastest growing economy among the world's major economies, outpacing China, which uh, uh, is growing at 5.3%. IMF attributed robustness and strength in domestic demand and a rising working age population behind its growth projections. India's Election Commission on Tuesday said that around 200 complaints that have been filed by various political parties and candidates since the implementation of the Model Code of Con Conduct, uh, out of the total complaints, action has been taken in 169 cases. The EC said that it's satisfied with the compliance of the Model Code of Conduct by various political parties. Indian security forces have neutralized at least 29 Maoist rebels in a gun battle in the central state of Chhattisgarh. Police officials said they received a tip-off about the presence of Maoists and launched a raid that led to the gun battle, which also injured three members of the security forces. Police have recovered huge consignment of weapons from the Naxals. Union Home Minister Amit Shah said that due to the offensive policy of the government, Naxalism has been confined to a small area as of now. In a devastating incident, six people died after a boat overturned in the Jhelum River with, uh, the, within the Gandharbal district of India's Jammu and Kashmir. On early Tuesday, incessant rain over the last few days has led to an increase in water levels of several water bodies in Kashmir, including the Jhelum River. 
And amid the intense politics ahead of the general elections, Meghalaya celebrated Shad Shuk Minsam festival, which saw participation of thousands of people in capital Shillong. Aimed at preserving indigenous traditions and culture, the festival celebrates coming of spring in the state. Here's a report by DD India correspondent Akshay Tongre. As the chill of winter recedes and charm of spring descends on the Khasi Hills, thousands of young men, women and children in beautiful traditional outfits perform traditional dance in the capital of Meghalaya. Even heavy rainfall fails to deter their spirit. This traditional dance is part of Shad Shuk Min Sim festival, which is the Khasi way of offering their thanks to God for all the blessings and bountiful harvest. The agrarian festival is a way for the people to assert their identity and preserve their culture and has been going on for hundreds of years in the state. We have been dancing and performing Shat Sukh for 113 years now. The Khasis uh, people are a matrilineal society. The significance of this dance is like it, it focuses on the way of life of the Khasis. For the people of the state, the festival is a proud moment which helps them preserve their culture, traditions and heritage. It takes place every year because uh, it's like a thanksgiving for be we cultivate crops mostly so it's like for better prosperity. We feel really really proud to represent Meghalaya. Held during the month of April, the festival celebrates spring symbolic as a season of rebirth and signifies the beginning of a new cycle during which new seedlings are planted. The Agrarian Festival also celebrates optimism for the coming year. In uh, 1899, the Sankasi was formed by 16 men, all under the age of 30. These 16 young men came up with the Sankasi organization okay, to protect, preserve and promote the Khasi indigenous, uh, the Khasi beliefs. This dance, for us, it signifies our identity. It signifies who we are as Khasis. As you can see, the sound of the drums, everything, it has its own meaning. The biggest visual highlight of Shad Shuk Minsim is a dance and accompanying music which showcases the beautiful culture of the state and helps the indigenous beliefs and customs flourish into modern time. And uh, on the occasion of Ram Nomi, uh, Ayodhya is all geared up for the magnificent celebrations at the Ram Janambhumi Temple. Ram Nomi, the birth festival of Lord Ram, will be celebrated and various types of offerings uh, shall be made to Lord Ram. Hundreds of thousands of devotees are expected to flock to Ayodhya for the Ram Nomi celebrations. And are you watching DD India News? Hour? Now it's time for some sports news. The torch of the Paris 2024 Olympic Games was lit in ancient Olympia in a traditional ceremony on Tuesday, marking the final stretch of the seven-year preparations for the Games that start on the 26th of July. Greek actress Mary Mina played the role of high priestess, lit the torch using a backup flame instead of a parabolic mirror that is normally used due to cloudy skies for the start of the relay in Greece and France. It will culminate with the lighting of Olympic flame in the French capital at the opening ceremony. Paris will host the Summer Olympics for a third time after 1980 and 1924 AD. And that's it in this edition of DD India News Hour. But uh, let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook or, uh, which is, uh, or X, formerly Twitter and Instagram. We'll be back with more news at it, as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Amrit Pal Singh from all my team here in Delhi. Thanks for watching DD India News Hour.